Alright, hello everybody, this is James Stanley with Daily Effects. Just wanted to do a quick sound check, so if you can hear my voice, please type in a Y. Please type in a Y if my voice is coming through, and as soon as we have confirm on audiovisual, we'll get this session started. Hey Gary, good to see you. Hans, Alan, Karan, Christine, Trevor Moreno, awesome. Looks like we got a full house. Loud and clear, good to go, and I just want to say thank you very much for your time in advance. Um, we're setting in what feels to be a pretty interesting market. Um, I say interesting, it's basically boring right now. Uh, to my eyes, the last week or so, maybe the last two weeks, it's really the first time that it's felt like summer, uh, at least here in FX. Um, so while many would look at this as a welcome respite, I'm uh, looking around the corner. We have the Jackson Hole Economic Symposium coming up on the, the latter portion of this week, starting on Thursday, going into the weekend. And... Uh, I'm trying to plot for what's ahead uh, as opposed to enjoying the summer months here. Uh, but nonetheless, I thought this was a good opportunity to take a step back. On these webinars, we'll normally look at shorter term setups using the daily, four hour, and the hourly charts. Because we have this big event on the calendar for later on in the week, and because it does have the potential to change some trends or to provide some motivation to pre existing trends. I thought this would be a good time to try to get some perspective on some of these pictures. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at longer term setups around the US dollar. Now as always, this session is all about you ladies and gentlemen, so if you do want to look at anything shorter term, or if you want to derivate from the longer term setups that I'm looking at, don't hesitate to fire a question in the chat box. I'll do my absolute best to help as much as I can. Um, but I'm going to start off with a lot of raw charts. I'm going to show you how I get these levels, uh, why I'm looking at them in the way that I am, so that when we go into Jackson Hole, we could have a cohesive game plan as to what we might be able to do around the U.S. dollar. So a fun and action-packed session that we have today, even if markets are going to remain calm and boring going into Jackson Hole here on Thursday. Um, last but certainly not least, this webinar is brought to you by Daily Effects, which is powered by IG. Anybody that signs up for this webinar gets a free demo account which is a great place to build strategies, test approaches, etc. The details of which should be located in your email. You can simply search for IG, details right there. We're going to go through a couple of quick risk disclaimers. I'm going to leave each up for about 15 seconds, then we'll get right onto the chart. We'll start, uh, start doing some drawings or drawings for those that are from New York. I don't know, we say drawing in Texas, they say drawings in New York. All right, so that's risk disclaimer part one. Risk disclaimer part two, the hypothetical trading disclaimer. We're going to look at some past trades. We're going to look at some strategy. Oh, we got a new first timer. Hello, Jeff. Welcome to the room. I'm going to give this another five seconds, and then we'll move on. All right, there we go. So let's start off here with the U.S. dollar. Um, reason I want to do this again is in the effort of trying to find some perspective here. Now, the dollar has been in this back-breaking break, downtrend for pretty much the entirety of 2017. We set this short-term top on just the second trading day of the year, and since then, it's basically been tumult here in USD. It started off with what was initially a pretty sharp sell-off throughout January, but notice where we caught a bid in February, we moved higher going into March, and we pretty much held the line all the way until March 15th right here. Now, what happened on March 15th? The Federal Reserve hiked, hiked, the Federal Reserve hiked rates. Now, this was pretty much well known. It wasn't much of a surprise here. But notice what happened here in the dollar where it sells off and it did not get back or has not gotten back above that pre-March rate hike of value since that move. Something happened here. Now, the big change, the obvious change was the fact that this is when the Fed started talking about balance sheet reduction. And then throughout the rest of the year, we've heard the Fed increase the sound on these calls for balance sheet reduction, and the dollar has just absolutely given it up and gotten smashed by more than 10% throughout 2017. Now you could see where we had temporarily broken below this June low at about 93 flat. And just a little bit further, about 91.92, we have the 2016 low here in the U.S. dollar. But let's take a quick step back. Let's put this in perspective. In reality, the sell-off that we've had this year is rather minor compared to the opposite move that we had in 2014 leading into 2015. Now, after that jump in the dollar took place, 
And notice when we peaked out here, we peaked out in March of 2015. It was a full nine months before the Fed actually hiked rates in December. Right back here. And then when they did hike rates, we came up, we tested that resistance. And then shortly after the rate hike, we go into another sell-off. That's what brought that 91.92 into the mix. But what I find really interesting here is if we take a Fib retracement over this major move, and then we had a 14.4% extension to that move. That catches the top. So we have a pretty good idea of where resistance is coming from, 14.4 extension off the prior major move. And now you can see we're even getting a little bit of play off these prior Fibonacci retracement levels. A big reason that I wanted to do this, or a big thing that I'm looking at here, is this low around 92.18 to 91.92. I'm doing this in the effort of trying to find where that bottom may show up in the US dollar if it hasn't already. I'm simply going to take it from this low at 91.92, the 2016 low. I'm going to draw it all the way over here to underneath that FIB. And I'm going to look at that as a potential support zone in that yeah, about 20 cent, 25 cent range here on the, on the underside of USD. Now, what you also probably notice here, and again, we're on a weekly chart, so we're looking at a good amount of data, is the way that we're getting a, a series of wicks cutting through resistance here at about 94.10 up to 94.48. Uh, it's another pretty interesting level that we have. I could cut that back, but I'm going to go in a little tighter here off the daily. There we go. Okay, so we could see where buyers had tried to bid this thing higher. Notice how this response was really very tepid. And, and I say that because each time we broke up to a new high, sellers came in shortly thereafter. New high, shortly thereafter, new high, shortly, uh, same thing, right? Now, it, it feels like the bow is starting to break. Notice we got this lower high that came in right here off this uh, trend line projection below that prior swing high. And then we came down to test support. Now, when I came into the office this morning, we had uh, we'd already had a rather robust response off of that support, but it feels as though sellers are going to try to take this in for another support test before we go into Jackson Hole. Um, yeah, Tim, it's a square root figure. But it's also commonly looked at as a uh, FIB extension level or sometimes even a retracement level. I rarely use it for retracements. Uh, extensions are kind of the bright spot for me with the 14.4. So dynamics in the U.S. dollar right now, fairly simple. We have price action support showing up around that 93 handle. And then we have resistance showing up around that same 94.10 to 94.48 level. Uh, this was the first zone we looked at like two weeks ago for resistance on the dollar, uh, positing that if I was going to look for a retracement, if I was going to look for a dollar reversal, I was going to need this zone to first yield before I'd be able to have uh, any types of machinations about a prolonged move of, of bullishness here in the dollar. We simply have not had that. This thing has just been crushed. Now, last year was a similar type of backdrop for the dollar when we went into Jackson Hole. When we went into Jackson Hole last year, of course, we had the big overhang of the election just a few months later. But the dollar had spent most of 2016 in a fairly weakened spot. We got that December rate hike in 2015. December, I think it was like mid-month. Yeah, that was the rate hike. And then we just kind of whittled higher. Notice there's not much of a response here um, at resistance, or at least buyers weren't able to push this up after that rate hike. And then we came into the first part of the year, and then stock started to spill. We had that risk aversion trade. And that led all the way into the Humphrey Hawkins testimony on February 11th. But the dollar spent most of the first half of last year moving lower. Now we set the support 91.92. And then we oscillated around. It was August, I believe, 27th. Well, I could tell you the candle. It's right here. It was August 26th of last year. I remember this very distinctly. We had Janet Yellen speaking earlier in the day, and she had basically said rate hikes are coming, or we're going to have some more rate hikes. She kind of alluded to September, but nobody really believed September because we all knew that we had the election in November. So that probably wasn't going to happen. That didn't seem to have much traction. But what did seem to catch everybody's ear was Stanley Fisher. Stanley Fisher came out and basically said, and I'm uh, uh, severely paraphrasing here, uh, the U.S. economy is strong. We're going to be able to kick rates higher. 
later in the year. And so that kind of alluded to or solidified the prospect of a December hike, which we eventually did get. But what was really interesting to me is how the dollar did not cross that low until like a month ago. That was the Jackson Hole low from last year. After the dollar was relatively weak. Spate of strength, presidential election, and then we had that blow off move until we ran in that 14.4 extension. So it's distinctly possible that we do see a reversal around Jackson Hole. It's a big deal. We're going to hear from Janet Yellen. She's got a speech scheduled. I believe it's 10 a.m. on Friday morning. So the potential is there. Uh, the big question is what's going to actually produce that, and then where might we want to best look for that theme. Now, on the dollar weakness side of the coin, and this is another uh, market that's going to see quite a bit of driver uh, or quite a few drivers over the next – few days, uh, specifically through Jackson Hole. Mario Draghi is making an appearance here. He's speaking later on Friday after Chair Yellen. So literally both of these currencies are going to be in the spotlight on Friday. The big hope around the ECB and intern Draghi is that they're finally going to give us some element of timing for a stimulus exit. Now, this is a really big deal for the euro because the last significant move that we had in the currency right in here was from markets attempting to front run QE. And most of the move came in before QE ever even started. QE started in the eurozone March 9th, the week of March 9th, 2015. That's when we made this low. That remained the low until we had a quick test in December of last year. So for the lifespan of European QE, the euro basically oscillated between resistance around 114.5 and, and support around 105 to 104.5. Now, we're getting the opposite of that taking place right now. And you can see this top side lift in euro dollar. It's basically just the opposite of this move of investors saying, well, they've got to do this, so I don't even need to wait for them to tell me that they're going to do it. I'm just going to try to position in it in advance so that when they do ultimately do this, there could be some additional room for this trade to run a little bit further. Now, with the ECB QE, it didn't work out like that. This was very much a sell the rumor, buy the news type of event. But there's a couple of long-term levels that are at play here, and that's what makes the continued development of this bullish move very, very interesting, especially for those that are looking to play continuation, as I myself am. All right, so the first move that I'm looking at is taking this top above 160 in 2008, drawing that down to the low that we had in January. The 23.6 is right here at 16.85. That's doing a really good job of helping to carve out near-term support uh, here in the pair. I have a secondary move I want to follow. I'm going to take the pre-QE high right there. And I'm going to draw that down to that same January low. And that gives me a second level to work with right here, 17.36. Now, there's a couple of cool things going on here once we get down to the weekly. Okay, so we could see that top side lift in the euro dollar throughout this year. And a couple of really key events here that uh, we'll look at when we get down to the daily. But after the euro dollar ran up above this zone right here, that it helped catch resistance... I mean, we had resistance come in around this level. That was the China Black Monday, 824 of 2015. So we have support at prior resistance. We also have support above a confluent zone. A couple of really interesting things going on there. Now, once we get down to the daily, this is where matters are going to get a lot more interesting. So the April ECB meeting right here, that was April 27th. What happened here is Mario Draghi was straight up asked if the ECB had talked about exiting stimulus. He said no, he deferred. And so the euro dollar spent like two weeks moving sideways. We came down and we tested prior support just a couple weeks later. But notice where buyers were unwilling to back away from defending that support level. And then that led to another topside lift here in the pair. Uh, June, very similar. June 8th was that ECB meeting. There was a whole bunch of stuff going on that day. We also had James Comey. We had... Uh, I believe there was something on Brexit, if memory serves. But June 8th, ECB, same thing. Mario Draghi straight up asked, as the ECB talked about exiting stimulus, he said no. 
again, your dollar trickles down to prior support, and then a couple weeks later, we get liftoff, continuation of the trend. Since then, this thing hasn't really looked back. We had a quick swing on the 4th of July. That led into a topside move with very, very little retracement, at least up until August. Now, as we've gotten into August, this thing has started to soften a little bit, but you can see where buyers are continuing to offer support at varying phases of this zone. I say at very varying phases of the zone. Notice how we had the first test. Buyers are pretty quick to jump back in and buy. A little bit deeper. That bullish response is a little bit weaker. And we've continued to test a little bit deeper within the support zone. This was Friday. On Friday, we actually tested below 1685, albeit temporarily. Excuse me, that was Thursday. And then again, we had a bullish response come right back. Now, I'm of the mind that we could see this retracement run a little bit deeper because we're just coming off of a fresh lower low, especially if we look at these shorter term, near term charts. The big trepidation that I have is buying this trend when it hasn't really had a lot of time to pull back or retrace or to shuffle out some sentiment, right? Because when we get one of these moves, what drives it? It's demand it's from, from buyers, right? Buying demand increases price and then supply pushes it back down. When we get to a price that's so high that buyers are reticent to jump back in or to add to positions. Well, that doesn't mean that it's not a bullish scenario any longer. It just means that we're at an artificially elevated price and the prices need to pull back. The big question is at what point are those bulls going to be able to re-enter the market to, 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 to take out anybody that might be selling or taking profits or any of that? I think we need a deeper retracement on this because pretty much any way that I look at it, we're, we're still resting pretty expensively. Like if I look at this, just going down to that 4th of July swing, notice that the 38.2 of that fib, here I'll make this a different color, a little easier to see. There we go. The 38.2 of that fib is confluent with the 23.6 of the primary fib that we looked at using that 160 top, right? A little bit deeper though, this is where things start to get a little more interesting, around 116. We could have a support level to work with. That's a real tight move that's just taking the 4th of July low. Uh, the one I like a little better is taking this low on August, or excuse me, on June 20th. If I use this one, that's going to have a couple of levels that I think are a little bit more proactive for a deeper retracement here in the euro dollar. There's that 16, around 16 level again, and then a little bit deeper on that 115 handle. I like that as well. Now, I put an article together last week on trading psychological levels, and I think this is relevant here just to kind of get an idea for how overbought this trend still feels to be. Now, you could notice where we had a fairly equalized market, even going out through June when we were still resting below some of these prior swing highs, but it's when we burst above that 115 level that we haven't really seen, I don't want to say much sanity, but much clarity here as this thing broke above 115 after not really resisting a whole lot, and we didn't really check back for support for more than a day. So I think this is something that could see a deeper retracement before that big picture long-term move is, is ready to continue. Um, that, of course, is unless Mario Draghi waves the red flag and says, we're going to do it, we're going to exit stimulus, Euro bulls, run amok, have fun. Until that happens, I think that we're going to uh, we're still resting a little high on the hog. We need a little bit more of a pullback before this thing's going to be ready. 116 could work. 115 could work. If we break back below this group of swing lows, like 113 and a quarter, 113 and three quarters, that's when I'm going to get a little bit more uh, skeptical on playing Euro continuation. Maybe looking for a deeper retracement down to like 110 or something like that. But uh, a couple of different lines that I'm looking for, for buyers to defend here if we do get a pullback in the Euro dollar. All right, so cable's pretty interesting as well right now. You know, putting this in the big picture, the post-Brexit price action in cable was, it's really not as severe as the post-financial collapse backdrop. Like if we look at what happened in the financial collapse around the UK, I mean, it was just brutal for the British pound. Pre-financial collapse were all the way above 210. We got down to 135. 
brutal, brutal move. So sure, breaks it, big deal. Breaks it right in here. But in reality, it's just a small, small part of the overall story of what's been going on with the UK. I mean, this is really a saga that, frankly, goes back to the beginning of, of the 2000s. This strong topside push in the British pound, that's going to have an impact. This strong sell-off in the British pound, that too is going to have an impact. Uh, it's unfortunate, but the British consumer and investor has just kind of been swung along here on both sides of the dollar. Um, you know, I know a lot of the attention is right here within this little move, you know, the post-Brexit move, but this matters. When the currency was at 210, just like 10 years ago, that's a big shift. It's a lot of dollar strength. Nonetheless, we're more interested in what's happening right now, or at least that's what, uh, that's what traders and markets are going to be following. Uh, more recently, throughout 2017, as we've had that, that pullback or that sell-off in the dollar, we started to see a little bit of strength begin to show here in the British pound, um, as indicated by this trend line right in here. This little cheap trend line off this weekly chart, just connecting the June low to the March low. But it pairs up with the higher highs, and what has been, at least so far, higher lows. Uh, more recently, we started to see this thing test lower. Uh, the big point of change here appeared to be the BOE rate decision at the beginning of the month. That was a super Thursday. And the BOE was predictively dovish here, as they have been. I think what really kind of caught folks off guard was the fact that while we were seeing this bullish move beginning and then continuing to develop throughout the earlier portion of the year, a lot of this was brought upon by rising inflation. I mean, we were seeing inflation in the UK well above the BOE's target, 2224. Uh, we've got it up to 26. And then when we had a 28 print in June for the month of May, that's when matters really started to develop. Um, it seemed that this was very much driven by the expectation that the BOE was going to get caught behind the eight ball. They were going to have to jerk rates up really quick to try to stem inflation. And that led to this rather strong move in the British pound. I say a strong move because if we look at it relative to Euro, it, uh, it, it was actually, the British pound was actually stronger than the Euro, albeit for a short period of time. There's March going into April. And we had a little bit of softness here off resistance throughout June. And that was when we were starting to build in the expectation that BOE, they might need to hike rates. Well, that was eviscerated in early August. The BOE basically called the, the, the problem. They said, look, inflation is rising faster than we would like. But if we do have to hike rates, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to get us out of our dovish stance. So while well, investors are apparently looking for a tectonic shift in policy out of Europe, if we do see any rate hikes out of the UK, it appears like it's going to be more of a one-off uh, type of effort to try to ward off inflation. So that's led to a rather bearish move of recent. There's BOE, NFP the following day brought upon a little bit of dollar strength. And notice where that dollar strength has just continued to play here against the British pound. Uh, most recently with a quick little break below that trend line after a few days of support and then resistance showed up. There we go, a few days of support and then resistance showed up. Do another fib here. If we take just this recent major move, that 2048 level was pretty key for me. It's the 618 of this most recent bullish move. That bullish extension since the UK inflation theme became a little more prominent. Um, now, once we go down to the four hour chart, here we go. This is where the setup is a little bit more alive. Okay, you see the swing low from earlier in July? That comes in like right at 128.09. Now, when I put this analyst pick together earlier in the week, or excuse me, it was uh, to end last week, uh, basically what I wanted to see is I wanted to see price run through 28.09 to give me a new monthly low to open the door for short side exposure. If I could get a print below that 28.09, that shows me the bulls are not defending that support at least as heavily as they were in the past. And then that opens the door for short side continuation, even though we are a couple of days ahead of Jackson Hole. Uh, but if you want that full setup, talked about that here in this analyst pick, and it is uh, available to anybody that might want it. But if I get that 2809 break, the objective then for me is to try to sell resistance. 
Um, I'm going to look for resistance that will support around 28 and a half. I'll even be open to taking it as deep as about 2870, maybe even like a 2885. Uh, but the key variable for me is being able to get a stop in above these swings, above this fib level, above the 50 fib of that most recent major move. So I'm able to stay in the short unless we, unless we break back into that bullish trend that's already broken. Uh, so I still like the side, uh, the short side of, of uh, the British pound. I think if we do end up with a bigger picture, larger scale dollar recovery, I think this thing is just going to fold. I don't know if it's going to be Briggs that like price action, but there's very, very few reasons for investors to want to hold long British pounds right now. The BOE is simply not going to defend you. They're looking for they're looking for a weaker spot, right? A uh, couple of questions on inverted head and shoulders. All right, so I'm not personally seeing a head and shoulders here. I mean, I could see where you're getting that, you know, trying to look at that as like a neckline or a shoulder line, excuse me, and then like maybe a neck down there. Uh, this would be too variated for me. I wouldn't really consider this a, a head and shoulders at all. Uh, I did see one pop up. I believe we talked about it last week on uh, Swissy. Swissy had some pretty cool stuff going on. Let me show you what I was looking at there. Yeah, you could see a little bit more of an inverted head and shoulders pattern here. Uh, we have the neckline right around 97.70. There's the head, shoulder A, shoulder B. Um, I'm not a big fan of head and shoulders pattern. This, this, this setup is a good reason as to why. There's all of this stuff going on, but there's really only one thing that I care about. There's only one thing I care about, and it doesn't matter if it came from head and shoulders or what. It's this. It's that resistance has continued to beat in at about 97.70, because if we're able to break above that, then that to me says that that sellers are relenting off of resistance. That we could have a continuation of the top side move. That break above 97.70 opens the door to try to take on some bullish exposure, and then I'm simply going to look to that level again to try to buy support at old resistance. Very simple stuff, nothing groundbreaking. But uh, the head and shoulders for me is far less interesting in the area of resistance itself. But let's work our way down here, just like we've done on these previous setups. All right, so weekly chart in Swissy. Again, you know, we're very much defined by a by a prior theme here, the, uh, the Swiss National Bank peg, right? I think broke back in um, 2015, right in here. But this is what created them, or created the need to set the peg in the first place. But since that peg broke, we've basically been looking at somewhat of a range here in Swissy, more or less. We've had resistance continue to beat in at about 103. Uh, there's been a proclivity for support to develop at about 94 and a half, 95, to the point where if I look at this on the daily and then just focus in on this, I mean, we're basically looking at a pretty chunky range in there, right? A chunky range, I mean, it's there's not a lot of formulation uh, as far as support. There's not like a perfect area for support to work with. Like we get a couple of swings that come down here to like 94.50, but then a couple of these that are a lot more shallow, like 95 and a quarter, 95.40. So it's a chunky range because it could still be worked with. It's just got to be worked with a little bit differently, like stop all the way below the support zone, taking on way more risk than I'd want to take a trade in a range. Um, and then having to take profits a little bit quicker when we get up to the resistance zone, like 98 and a half as opposed to 99 and a half. Karan says, yeah, Swiss, horrid chart. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a big fan on Swissy, to be honest with you. Um, but if the setup's there, yeah, I'll, I'll take it. Um, the reason I have this one on the radar right now is because this could be one of the more attractive dollar weakness setups that I'm looking at. Uh, as we've had a continued persistence at the support that just hasn't been able to break yet. Notice where we have this rising trend line right in here. Project it. It's now become new resistance. The 50 fib of this move, to my mind, is relatively important. I'm simply taking the top in 2010 out of the bottom in 2011. But the reason I think this 50 fib at 94 is important is because if we do break below that level, then we basically have fresh two-year lows to work with. And at that point, I think that we could have a continuation move that may be able to run down to the big figure of 90. I'm not going to want to get so greedy as to put the only profit target down there at 90 flat because we have a ton of swings in here at like 90 and three quarters, 91 and a half. I might even be able to take something off at 92 and a half for a relatively quick hit. Um, but if we do see a dollar weakness scenario, I like the idea of uh, continuing to look here on uh, on Swissy. 
Now, if we're able to break above 97.70, I scrap that plan, and then I look to play the top side breakout as we burst up to new monthly highs. Okay. So a break below 94 opens the door for short side exposure. A break above 97.70 gives me a top side break of that inverse head and shoulders pattern. At which point I could look for dollar strength to continue playing out. But you see, now we're just looking at the head, right? So the only thing that matters is the support and the resistance that come off the duration of the pattern. I know a lot of folks that will try to use a measured move kind of deal where they'll say the head and the neck is this far away, so I'm going to apply that to the profit side or the target side. Not my forte. If this thing pops, I'm going to manage it the way I manage any other trade. All right, dollar CAD. This thing's been, this thing's had a pretty big year for dollar CAD. All right, so a couple of interesting things going on here. Um, now, if you remember when we came into 2016, this was a really, really good example of the danger of cross border currency cross rates. Because what was happening here is the Bank of Canada was extremely dovish at the time. The Fed was getting a bit more hawkish, a bit more hawkish, a bit more hawkish, and this led to a sharp spike in the dollar cat exchange rate. In May of 2015, we're sitting at a spot at 120. January of 2016, we're all the way up at 146. And this is a big deal. This is the type of thing that could create changes that regular folks that don't trade or follow markets or exchange rates notice. Uh, in Canada, specifically, this <laughs> led to and I know this is a first world problem, I don't want to pretend like it isn't, but it led to what was called the Canadian cauliflower crisis. The cauliflower a product that's, that's widely imported from California um, was going for like 10 to $14 a head. There was a supply reason there, but it was also the dramatic drop in the Canadian dollar that really exposed that deficiency in the spot rate. Well, that scenario turned on a dime. We started to see that dollar weakness in January of 2016. We also saw the Bank of Canada uh, pivot on stimulus, saying we're going to take a back seat on stimulus, and we're going to let Justin Trudeau and his newly elected government do their job of trying to embark on fiscal stimulus. So we had a, a strong Canadian dollar, a weak U.S. dollar. This was shortly after we had the polar opposite of those themes. So we saw a fairly sizable move as we came right back down to 126 in the first half of 2016. Now, more recently, <laughs> you can see where the dollar had climbed going into the presidential election, going into 2017. But then we had the Bank of Canada again say, we might not need this stimulus stuff so much. And so the Canadian dollar got strong again while the U.S. dollar was getting weak. So over the last couple of months, since early May, dollar CAD is down about 10%. The U.S. dollar on itself in 2017 is down about 10%. So dollar CAD has made a same size move as taken the dollar all year to put in. That 10% in dollar cat is just since the beginning of May, right in there. Now, you can see what's happening right down here. We pop down below this low, the May 2016 low. So I think we have technical new two-year lows here, uh, even deeper, two years and a couple months now, uh, lows here on dollar cad. We are also trading below a key, key level here, 126.21, which you probably saw off that Fibonacci level off of the monthly chart back here. I'm simply taking this top in 2002, drawing that down to the low in 2007. The 50% retracement of that level, uh, of that move is 26.22. Now you can see where we have some intra-month, intra-week, intra-day resistance coming in off of that. I'm going to do a second fib in here and try to find some confluence. There we go. All right, so now once I go down to the weekly chart, you can see from that second fib in green, the 38.2 comes in at about 25.39. So it gives me kind of a swath of support resistance to work with. And you can also see where daily support is coming out right now. 
Now this is a pretty dramatic drop. It's kind of similar to the move that we have in the Euro in that it just didn't put in much retracement. There's not many nearby uh, jump off points to look for a continuation setup. You can see where we put in a 23.6 retrace. That was soundly sold though. There's that 23.6 retracement about 27.40 up to 27.70 for that resistance. So this one's a little bit more difficult to try to time any types of retracements. I think the scenario that I want to see this one run with is I would like to see a quick patch of dollar strength show up around Jackson Hole. Um, you know, something that could be enough to clear some of the sentiment that we're seeing on DXY as this thing is just so heavily short right now. Maybe enough to even pop above this 94.50 resistance level. But at that point, it could open up that 38.2 retracement of that most recent major move, uh, about 29.5 probably even take it down to where this, this swing was about 20 and a half. It gives me a hundred pip zone here to look for resistance for a short side dollar CAD setup. It's pretty much the only way I want to trade dollar CAD right now. Okay, so I've got to hustle. We've got uh, like 20 minutes left and uh, I'm taking my sweet time here. Okay, so Aussie. I also put in another one of those uh, really just interesting interesting commodity-based moves uh, back in June going into July. Um, here, let's draw this tops down, and then uh, we'll get to near-term price action. Okay, so for the big picture fib, I'm taking that uh, 2001 low up to the 2011 top. So, I mean, we're spanning a good amount of distance here, 47.78 up to 110.80. So, big, big move in here. And then we have a secondary major move, which is basically just the financial collapse. The financial collapse low, taking that 60 spot. Oh, Got to get this exactly where I want it. There we go. And we'll differentiate. And we got the second move in green. Okay, so same kind of deal, right? And see where we have a confluent level that's working right now. Uh, it's helping to show us a reason for near-term price action to be be putting in a pause. Go down to the weekly chart, and then we're going to see where that, I mean, there's basically like a year plus worth of congestion here. Um, there we go. Year plus worth of congestion between like a 77.50 level of resistance. And we had this uh, rather cheap rising trend line, but it's basically a long-term ascending wedge type of formation. There we go. Now you see the top side break back in July. Let's get down to the daily. We can see where these fib levels are coming in. There we go. Okay, so we had the top side break of that resistance zone in July, and this thing just didn't look back at all. It was just an aggressive top side burst. But once we got above 80, the die changed. 80 in Aussie feels a lot more expensive than 79.5, 79.30, 79.50 even. Um, so after we put in a correction on that bullish move, prices have come back into that zone of prior support, and they're now continuing to show some resistance here. Um, I'm not a big reversal guy. I much pref much more prefer to go in the direction of the trend or the direction of the bias, and the reason is because I'm of the opinion that markets over the long term are going to be relatively chaotic. So if you get that trend side bias on your side, the more the better. Uh, but this is one of those areas where I think reversal may be nearing, uh, especially if we do end up with a burst of strength in the dollar on Jackson Hole. The fact that we've seen continued persistence of sellers at about 79.47, the 618 of that secondary move, the financial collapse move, um, that to me shows that we could have a, a short side setup to work with here with a stop above this zone for an aggressive setup. If I wanted to go for a longer term, bigger picture setup, I could even look above that 80 and a half, uh, call that an 8066 top. You can look for that on a reversal for a long USD type of theme. All right, got to hustle here. Uh, Euro yen. All right, same type of thing. We got some long term moves that are continuing to show some element of relevance here. Um, I'm going to start this with a monthly chart. I mean, it's hard to believe Euro yen was once at 280 as uh, we're here about 50% of that value. 
To those that play meaner version FX, price does not always come back. So that's the trader that uh, bought cable at 211 in 2006. They're still waiting. Um, all right, so the first move I wanted to look at here this is the Abinomics move. This is basically just taking the uh, Q4 2012 pop in the yen and drawing that up to the top that we had in 2014. This one's had some pretty good movement with it. Notice where we had some resistance develop off the 618. Off the 50, we currently see some support off the 382 of this move at 128.52, and that level it just won't break. Um, I've been following it for a while now, and it's it's been pretty decent support. I mean, we've tested but pulled right back. This leads into the second move that I can work with. I'm going to take that same top in 2014. I'm going to draw that down to the the low from last year. There we go. And same kind of deal, right? It gives me a little bit of a zone to work with here. This one is about 108 pips wide. But once we get onto the daily, we can see where there's a lot of different stuff happening in here. And this one is starting to feel like a reversal is on the, on the way. Um, and I get that from the fact we had this evening star pattern show up right in here. We had a quick wick, but that was after a lower low came in right down here. So if I look at this on like a four-hour chart, it looks like this thing wants to start peeling over. Now, I'm not going to look for any short exposure in Euro Yen until we get a break and we get prices moving down in more of a concerted fashion. And the primary reason for this is because if I want to buy the Yen, I think there's a better place to do it. Uh, I think Pound Yen could be a more accommodative backdrop for long Yen exposure. A very similar type of setup. Uh, from Ryan, do you attribute reducing volumes in dollar CAD to a wait and see with Jackson Hole? I think that's very much the kind of the MO across markets right now. Uh, I work here in, in New York City, and I mean, the streets are empty. I mean, as empty as I've seen them during the summer, probably ever. Um, it's not quite, you know, Christmas holiday season empty, but it's pretty quiet. So I think that that's, that's kind of what it is. I mean, we had this little open spot on the calendar, which we haven't really had much of this summer, um, where we have like, you know, a couple of big events and then we have this Jackson Hole deal and then NFP next week and then um, and then Draghi the week after. But this is the closest thing as, as the summer's had to open time in the calendar. So I think if anything, a lot of folks are just taking the time off, going to the beach, hanging out and, you know, hoping nothing goes awry. Um, okay, so same similar type of move. I'm going to take the 2011 low here. I'm going to take that up to that uh, 2015 high. The 618 of that move at 147.04 has done a pretty good job of helping us set resistance on this thing. All right, go down to the weekly. Actually, scratch that. We're going to go down to the daily. I'm going to live dangerously. Uh, that's the flash crash. And then we have this March low in here. Trend line gives us a third point of confirmation. And then notice where just two weeks ago, prices tried to hold up here, just couldn't do it. We slid below, rechecked resistance right underneath, and we've continued to move lower from there. Now, there's another move that I can use for a fib retracement. I'm basically going to take that from the flash crash low up to the December 15th high. There we go. And this puts a lot more focus on that 135 level. 135 right around where that March swing came in, that point of touch that I have on the trend line. Um, but it's also confluent area here. It's 764, that Abinomics move. It's also the 50 fib of this most recent major move. If I get a break below that level, I'm going to look for prices to eventually trickle down and test those lows. I don't know if we're going to get all the way down to 123, but it gives me a couple of very adequate levels uh, to look at for targets. 132 and three quarters, 130 flat is going to be a big level on my radar, and then 129.04 is the last stop before we go down to retest those lows. If I'm looking for yen strength, this is the place that I want to do it. The reason is it combines what I was talking about a little earlier with the British pound, where I think the BOE is just going to do whatever they can to avoid saying that they were wrong on Brexit. I think they're pretty pot committed here. And I mean, even if they get three points of inflation, they have to hike rates. I think they're going to still try to remain dovish. 
they're going to do whatever they can as long as Mark Carney's at the helm, uh, or until inflation screams above three and a half points, at which point they're not going to have much flexibility at all. But it combines that theme with the potential for yen strength. I think both of those scenarios, they play in a similar backdrop of uh, risk aversion, um, not too dissimilar than what we saw begin to crop up at the early portion of the month. But if I'm looking for yen strength, if I'm looking for risk aversion, it's the place that I, it's the place that I still want to do it. Uh, I even had some setups around that. I'm happy to share it with you. Give me a quick second, and uh, I'll locate those. Setups are still active. There we go. Euro yen, pound yen for continuation reversal of risk aversion. All right. So that's what I have for today, ladies and gentlemen. I want to see what kind of questions you have. Please don't hesitate to ask me anything trading related. All right, so a uh, question here. Do you know what broker is better if Turbo Forex or FXCM? I don't know what Turbo Forex is. Um, I said anything trading related, I guess I should have been maybe a little more specific. Um, let's, let's go down and see if we have. Uh, any additional questions on setups? There we go. My opinion is uh, from Robbie Hill. My opinion is dollar index is fixing to break up. Yeah, I mean, I could see that. We usually get uh, – it's not always readily apparent when we have a driver avail itself. It, it can often take, you know, a couple months or weeks for a theme to really develop before we look back and say, oh, well, well that was the thing. You know, it's kind of like that with the, the, the Draghi theme throughout this year where he's been, you know, continually denying that the ECB is talking about stimulus exit, but markets are continually fading that, you know, with a little more power each time. Um, I mean, I don't know what you mean by break up. I mean, to me, this is, this is a quasi-corrective move. I think this is an absolute gift for Janet Yellen. I remember when we came into... Uh, 2016, right after the Fed had hiked rates for the first time in like nine years, we came into 2016 like right in there. Uh, Janet Yellen straight up said one of the biggest risks that the Fed had was being one of the only major central banks that was tightening rates. And that's a very legitimate concern, you know. I mean, what's basically happened with Japan could happen to the U.S. and that could be very damaging. And what happened in Japan? I go all the way back here on the monthly. There we go. What happened in Japan was the Plaza Corp just really crushed that economy, right? When the Plaza Corp was instituted, this instilled a ton of artificial strength in the Japanese yen. It made Japanese exports uh, a lot less competitive, and that eventually rolled in through Japanese corporates. Japanese corporates started to suck wind, and then before you know it, we have uh, about almost full three decades of deflation. You know, that's why Abinomics was so well received when it was initially announced back in 2012, because it was something that, for the first time, Japan had hope of, of, of reversing that curse that pretty much started around the Plaza Accord. And, you know, we got a blip in the radar at this point, more or less. Um, but that really strong Japanese yen, I mean, it just continually placed pressure on exporters. And it wasn't something that would allow for real brisk growth to take place in the Japanese economy. It became a huge hindrance. I mean, and now it looks like even Shinzo Abe starting to get hit by that continued languish Japanese inflation. Um, in 2014, we had a real brief period where Japanese inflation climbed above four points. Uh, oh, just under four, excuse me, above two, above three. I think we were scratching under the surface of four, and then it just just fold it over and that's goes hand in hand with this movement of strength in the yen as investors are getting a little more skeptical that what they're doing is actually going to work. <laughs> Karan says the queen might just might just make a comeback. Hashtag feeling sentimental. <laughs> I don't know, there's some pretty bad days under the monarchy too, you know. It's um, you know, kind of a, a funny thing. I, I've done a lot of study of the Civil War and uh, the U.S. Civil War. And when the U.S. Civil War started off, I mean, I guess much of the world was laughing at the United States, uh, you know, basically the failed experiment of uh, democracy. It's amazing what can happen in 150 years.
uh, from Robbie Hill, if you get dollar index to break up out of 90.30.70, then you will see a dollar run as people stop out of positions. My opinion, it's getting near. I mean, I can see that. I mean, there, you know, there's a lot of potential scenarios here. Um, you know, for the dollar to really get smashed. Um, you know, for the dollar to really get smashed on the underside. I personally think that we need to see something at the SDR, you know, like in the IMF special depository receipts basket. You know, if they do a, you know, a, a flip in the allocation there or something, maybe with the yuan, um, you know, that could provide a pretty daunting backdrop for the U.S. dollar. I have a hard time seeing it, though. I mean, at least from where we're at now. You know, if 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 we saw the dollar scream up to a 110 or a 115, well, now you have a very very uh, relevant reason for the Federal Reserve or the Treasury Department, which who would actually be uh, go to the IMF and say, hey, look, we we got to redraw this SDR basket. This isn't going to work. Um, you know, too much exposure in the dollar. This is crushing our exporters. We got to do something here. Basically, kind of like a Plaza Accord, too. And I wouldn't rule that out. I just don't know that the rest of the world would fall for it in the way that they did in 1985. Uh, for Quran, plus weaker queen, better coming out of Brexit. I think a lot of these political themes are very cyclical in nature. I think is, you know, in this, <laughs> to relate this to today's webinar, it's one of the reasons I wanted to take a step back in the effort of perspective. Um, you know, to kind of look at the bigger picture, because most of the time I'm here on the hourly chart, I'm basically just looking for setups, ways that I could risk a dollar to try to make two, more or less. And when we're focusing in on the, you know, the nuances or, you know, a blade of grass, we'll have a tendency to miss the forest or the big picture. And, you know, to me in the big picture, this is a corrective move in the dollar after a, a, a vicious topside spike in 2014 um, and a pretty aggressive range the last or most of last year. Saw a topside breakout that got resolved. A little more calming when, when I look at it from the big picture perspective. Um, how this is relevant in politics, um, we've seen this with this, I don't want to say the cyclical nature of democracies, but with the cyclical nature and the growth of democracy, where, you know, it's rare that a that a socialist enterprise will turn directly democratic or a monarchy will turn democratic. You know, it usually happens in waves and phases. Right now, it feels like we're getting a little bit of a pullback in democracy, hence a lot of those, a lot of those comments. A lot of those themes we're seeing as well. Uh, for Jeff Masso, uh, how do you think the slowdown in the Chinese real estate market may affect AU? Well, that's a good question. I think the bigger question there is how is the real uh, how is the slowdown in the AU real estate market going to affect Chinese investors in the AU? That's the bigger question in my mind. I know that the RBA has been trying to focus on macro prudential, but I mean, frankly, the price of real estate real estate in Australia compared to a lot of places, uh, similar comps in the states, is uh, aggressive to say the least. It's a, it's a balancing act there, though. You know, if if you're the RBA, if you're, um, you know, if you're an Australian politician, you don't necessarily want to go over to China and say, hey, no more. Well, because now you're going to create a gigantic dent in demand, a huge glut in supplies, and then you're going to have, you know, pretty erratic movements in price. Um, I guess the big elephant in the room for Australia right now is just it's in exactly what you're asking about, Jeff. It's in it's in prices. It's I don't want to say widely agreed upon, but there's many out there that use the B word in referring to Australian real estate bubble. That is, um, so there's really two ways that something like that can go. If if we have a bubble, I'm not going to say definitively that we do, but if we do, there's really two ways to go. One is let the bubble burst. That was like 2007 in the States. That's not good for anybody. We all know what happens there. Um, central bank has to respond with, you know, some emergency-like accommodation. Not a great scenario. The other, and I think this is what Greenspan was looking at as he started to notice more signs of a bubble leading into Bernanke, which is try to stay stable with rates. with a slight bias towards accommodation, it feels to me like that's what the Fed has been doing up until, basically up until Trump, more or less. 
you know, because every time we'd go into a rate decision, they were very clear about what they were looking at or what they were wanting or what they were thinking. You know, it's this year that's, that's seen them start to take on a little bit more risk with things like the balance sheet and then, you know, the dual tightening mandate, balance sheet and higher rates. I think that the RBA is already looking at that prospect. I mean, they've been talking about macro prudential now for a couple of years. I don't know what else can be done there, you know, other than, uh, you know, policies that could probably be controversial, you know, as far as demarcating is how much real estate a foreigner is allowed to buy or something along those lines. There's not a lot of great solutions. Um, but I think that that market is you know, very much feeding on itself. If AU prices start to come down, even with stability in Chinese real estate, then I think that's something that would probably hit the Chinese buyer in Australia, maybe even a little bit more than if China was softening itself. If China's softening, I, I think the Chinese nationals are trying to get money out of the country, you know, even if they got to buy real estate in places that are maybe even a little bit, a little bit overbought still at that point. Uh, from Quran, can we check out the gold chart for sure? Yeah, we had a falsy at 13. Um, this one's setting up, setting up in a fairly cool manner. Um, you know, we basically just have kind of an ascending wedge formation that's building right now. I'm taking the low from December, point of connection July 4th. Notice we've just been knock, knock, knocking on resistance store. And we got a quick break above. Be a briefly on Friday, but that was soundly sold. And since then, we've been turning lower. Lower high came in right there, and now we're testing a support. If I build this off the hourly chart, this battle line is going to be a little more clear. Yes, you could call it a head and shoulders. I hate that pattern, but uh, neck, shoulder, shoulder, head. Look for that neckline break. Uh, from Moreno, uh, could Janet Yellen surprise with a speech tightening QE this week? Um, well, that's what balance sheet reduction is really about, right? The prospect of undoing QE, not necessarily tightening it. Um, balance sheet reduction is QT, or quantitative tightening, or the opposite of QE, quantitative easing. Um, we pretty much know that that's what the Fed wants to do for right now. We don't know exactly when the Fed has implied, or rather markets have inferred, uh, that to mean September, but it couldn't end up being December. That's kind of what we're looking at right now. We were, uh, we're pretty sure the balance sheet reduction is coming. We even pretty much know how much and how. Um, I'm more, interested in when they're going to do it and then how aggressively they're going to look to hike rates in tandem with that. I think that's what we're looking for. The bigger question on the, 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 the end of QE is for Europe, Mr. Mario Draghi. Uh, from Edgardo Salazar, Euro is getting better than USD. It's all relative, my friend. It uh, depends on which one spends better in your pocket, I guess. Um, in many cases, currencies do display a cyclical nature to the point where I wouldn't want to say that one currency is better than the other. Um, you know, unless there's a legitimate debasement concern from a national or from a central bank, something along those lines, I'd be I'd be reticent to say that one currency is better than the other. Eye the beholder, right? Uh, from Quran, uh, smash dollar. Are you envisaging a move to 104 for dollar yen? I am sorry. I had that one on the list. I just skipped right past it. Um, we could definitely dice up dollar in here before we uh, before we finish off today. 104 is possible. I think if we do get that downside break in the dollar, the next big zone to watch for is parity. It's at 100. Um, you know, 104 could come into play as good prior resistance, but I think if we're going to clear through 108, I think I think parity is the next stop to look for. So what makes dollar yen really interesting to me is how we've basically been in a modal where this pair has taken on a proclivity to trend, which 
when I started in FX, that was not the case. Um, if anything, it was choppier, range bound, slightly unexciting. But Abinomics brought on yen weakness, got a little bit of congestion of the leg of that yen weakness, and then we saw that come out after uh, BOJ went to negative rates. And then we got another topside pop here after the QE reflation trade. And then over the past four months, we've basically been range bound. A decent range between like 109 and 114 and a half. And we're just setting around support right now. I have this on my sleeper set up for the long side of the dollar. If we do see the dollar as the star after Jackson Hole, I think it's going to show up pretty well here. Um, now, with that being said, there is a reason that this has not put in another reflation-like move. Now, we know the dollar has just been getting crushed throughout 2017, but while it's been getting crushed, dollar yen has just been ranging around. So this highlights how the yen has still been relatively weak. One of those reasons I wouldn't want to look at the short side of Euro yen at the moment. Uh, but if we do see some dollar strength show up around Jackson Hole, as in maybe if the Fed says, look, our prerogative is to normalize rates, balance sheet reduction is a secondary concern, we're going to head strong, look at rate hikes, we're going to cut the balance sheet as we can, and we'll start that as we see, as we see the environment is fit for it. If they do something like that, then I think we're going to get a sharp move in the dollar. And if that does play out, I really like the support zone that's just been I mean, it's been holding pretty well on dollar yen. Uh, to get a little bit more specific with it, actually, let's use this chart. I like this one a bit better. Uh, a bit more specific, there's the reflation trade, uh, Fibonacci retracement, taking the 1215 top from the election night bottom. See, at 114.55, this is helping to set resistance at the 23.6. You can see this little price action zone of support after the April low came down, right around 108 and a half. Since then, we've held that line right around 108 and 108.85. So to my eyes, this is a range. I don't want to look for a, a short side break of this range until we actually do clear below support, and then we clear below this FIB at 107 and 7 eighths. Until then, I'm going to look to play this as a range. If we do see dollar strength, I think this is something that's going gonna, gonna to show it fairly prominently. There's a lot of levels to look at here. Um, on the top side of the move, similar to what we did in dollar Swiss, there's an inverse head and shoulders pattern that had shown up here. Had shown up here, being the keyword. Right, it was had because there's the head, shoulder, shoulder, neck. That neck's at 111. And again, I don't care about that head and shoulders pattern. What I care about is that resistance zone. It's the only thing that matters to me. Bullish break above resistance shows that bulls are able to outnumber bears. That's when I want to start looking to get long. Till then, wait. Let this thing build. Let it do its thing. If it doesn't fit my profile, so be it. I'll keep waiting. And I'll wait until it does. Uh, but that, my friends, is what I have for today. Uh, really appreciate the time for everyone, ladies and gentlemen. On Thursday, we are going to be going at 1 o'clock. Um, as we mentioned last week, we're going to normalize times across the webinars and uh, 1 p.m. Eastern time this Thursday. I'm going to put a link for my Twitter page in the chat box. This is, uh, this is how you can stay in touch with me or see when I'm doing a webinar or uh, get the uh, recording of this archive or ask me questions or whatever. But I uh, just want to say thank you so much, everybody, for your time. I hope you have a fantastic rest of the day. And as always, happy trading, ladies and gentlemen.